also on the back of the bottle now in this new overlay. Uh, so you'll see your website in the front and the overlay in the back. And that is a new thing that we're doing with 135. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Evan Goldstein. Evan, where are you right now? I am in San Francisco where, where you know, they used to say that we have like August, right? Because it's always foggy in August. <laughs> and or, October used to be our Indian summer. Well, today is um, Fogtober. It's really, I was actually, I had a short sleeve shirt on and I had to put a sweater on. Crazy. Cold, cold. Awesome. And Tim, you're calling in today? Yeah, from sunny New Mexico. This is uh, the most beautiful time of the year here. Uh, the leaves are all turning. It's uh, about 70 degrees during the day and in the 40s at night. It's just perfect weather. So glad awesome. to be here with you. Lucky Sorry, you. my finger was triggering <laughs> early. So we don't have Madeline Trafon today. She is um, very much otherwise engaged, but we do have, of course, Evan and Tim with us. And Evan, you're doing 135 and Tim is doing 246, right? That's the plan. Yep. That's awesome. Plan. So guys, I will pull the wine up for those of you who don't have the wine with my white background. And Evan, your go. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. And for those of you who are, are veterans, grizzled veterans of MTW, welcome back. Hope you're enjoying the kit. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully today by the end of the session, you'll have a good sense of what the webinar element of uh, the MTW kits are. It happens every month, once a month. And um, it's always a nice idea if you have the opportunity and time to actually taste the kits a little earlier than going on the webinar. So the webinar is more for confirmation and you're not doing it on the fly. Um, so if you can find the time uh, to do that, that's great. And use this for validation, sparge your wines in between. One of the things we always do is go over the wines quickly and there will always be those three questions along the slide that kicks things off to sort of consider. I may not, nor Tim may not go over every everything, but these are questions you should ask yourself, self, as you're evaluating the wine. In this case, you know, if it's cool, you know, what cool climate things have versus what warmer climate things have. Ask yourself that in your head uh, in terms of effects on the wine, stylistically, alcohols, acidities, things like that. Um, in this particular case for wine one, based on what we know about alcohol body, what would the alcohols be? Um, wine B, and again, is that a clue, again, to that region cooler or warmer climate? And then thirdly, texturally, so important to wines, when the wine is in your mouth, how does it present itself? Is it lean, round, smooth, creamy, austere, Episcopalian? That was a joke. Nobody laughed, that's all right. Um, so let's go, ahead and, yeah. <laughs> let's go ahead and enjoy this wine. So as I smell it, uh, first of all, let's talk, talk about looking at it. That's something that Madeline always does on wine one. So as Lee Meng mentioned, use a white background and then sort of tilt your wine across and look from the cross section from the middle, deep end of the pool to the shallow end of the pool. We talk about core color and we talk about rim or edge color. Uh, in this particular case, the wine's sort of a nice uh, sort of medium straw color, maybe starting to push the earliest stages of yellow, um, the rim's pretty clear, um, not so much going on there. Not a lot of highlights, still a kiss of green in the highlights, nothing silver, but the green's kind of fading, I think a little bit over time. Um, as I swirl the wine around, it's moving very quickly. It's sheeting down the sides of the glass. I'm not getting a lot of tearing. Um, again, interesting information to look at there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's what we got. As I am, um, and nothing floating, nothing doing the backstroke, no effervescence, no crazy stuff there. Let's focus on where the smell and taste are. And I'm going to take the two of these together, first smelling, then validating through tasting. Um, right off the bat, I always look for a few things. It reminds me always to check my boxes for the fruit elements of the wine and thereabouts fruit encompassing things that are organic. So for me, I know this is probably improper MS thing to do. That's not only fruit, but that could be vegetable, that could be herbal, anything that springs out of the ground. For me, that is the F trigger. That was not meant to sound bad. The F trigger is anything organic. So I'll address all those things. E being earthiness, both inorganic and organic earth, and W being uh, any wood influence or commenting on the vessel in which it's aged if there's not wood there. So right off the bat here, uh, I am getting some fruit in this wine. The fruit nature tends to be a little bit on the riper side, and I'm getting a combination of sort of sweet citrus, so that kind of pink grapefruit, that more uh, Meyer lemony element, even perhaps uh, soft elements of, of, of tangerine or orange. I'm getting ripe apple fruit here. Again, more sort of in that golden delicious um, and uh, yellow apple, certainly not a Gravenstein for those of you who are in California, those are in season now for about two weeks. 
um, and not green by any definition. I am certainly picking up a lot of stone fruit here and perhaps along with the sort of riper citrus, that's what I'm uh, picking up here and it's a combination of uh, perhaps slightly under ap underripe apricot, but some white and yellow uh, peach, white and yellow tang uh, nectarine rather, and then sort of a very strong, almost kind of cantaloupe melony uh, character underneath there, some florals, uh, more in the sort of citrus and uh, tree blossom thing, apple blossoms, uh, lemon, lemon blossoms, maybe even a little bit of orange blossom, picking up a bit of uh, ginger, both fresh and in the powdery form, and picking up a little bit of, um, well, ginger's, I guess ginger root in that case, not ginger powder, because again, if I'm sticking to more organics, some sort of soft um, herbal things, probably more kind of in the freshening stage, almost verbena-esque a little bit. Um, just very fresh and, and, and kind of bright. As we move into the earthy element of things, I'm picking up probably more inorganic earth than earth. So not so much the potting soils and the turned dirt and all of that, but more sort of that kind of stony, uh, slatier uh, sort of character in the wine. And um, I am getting something that sort of suggests wood to me, more sort of in that kind of textural and very light a nutty element here, which is not so much new wood, um, although there are certainly some sweet spice elements to this wine, um, but more sort of in that nutty sort of oxidative thing that happens with, with oak and particularly larger oak over time in older barrels. So I'm picking up a little bit of, uh, of something like that there. Um, it's nice. It's very, it's very, it's sort of subtle, it's sort of in between that elegant to soft mode. And as I taste it, Right off the bat, it's got a ton of fruit and it's actually um, off dry. I mean, there's a little bit of sweetness there. And how do you measure the difference between ripe fruit and sweetness? Sweetness lingers. So if you're still picking up sort of a very light, balanced by acid, but nevertheless sort of sweet, sweet flavor in your mouth, that's the difference between dry to off dry. And then if it was sweet, obviously you would know it's sweet. So I'd put this wine classically in the realm of off dry. The acidity level is, is, is moderately high, pushing high. Why do I know that? Even though the acid doesn't pronounce itself in that sort of uh, lightsaber-like way, nevertheless, it has to be high because the wine is refreshing. I mean, I'm going, but nevertheless, there's sugar there. So it has to counterbalance against the sugar. Uh, the structure on the wine is relatively light in body. Um, I'm not getting any warmth in my chest and the length on it is moderate. Uh, overall quality of the wine is pretty tasty, uh, enjoyable. I could sit around and finish this bottle. I could perhaps even drive and drink this bottle based on what I'm getting in the thing. Uh, wine for driving. Uh, and it, no, it tastes quite good. Don't say that, Evan, but it would you could do it. Anyway, that's what I'm getting there. That's what I think about the wine. So where do we go with this? So let's take a look at what our grape choices are here. Gewürztraminer, as many of you know, is a super highly aromatic grape. Lots going on. Um, spicy in a positive way, not in a Hunan-esque or Sichuan way, but a lot going on, very floral, lots of rose petals, et cetera, et cetera. Riesling uh, is probably more in that sort of, I, I don't know, <clears throat> if, if I would consider it slightly aromatic, it's a little shy. There's definitely stuff going on there. Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio tends to be the most neutral of the three of those. And then of course, other. Other would be not so much that um, it's an other, uh, an other grape, but if you were thinking about the wine as you were thinking about it, is there another grape that it gave you an idea to? In which case, let us know, because we can talk through that when we move through. Then as far as the regions, obviously, once you have your grape, you want to sort of associate it with those regions. Most all of those grapes, in fact, all of those grapes are grown in all of the regions. So you can go ahead now and vote. Voting is completely unequivocally anonymous. Nobody will associate your name there. So go ahead, give it a go, hang your hat, give it a, a check and, uh, and point it out here. And we'll see as people come in where it is. So remember what you've got here. You've got You've got um, soft body, you've got bright acid, you've got a, a lot of bright stone fruits and, and, and citric aromatics. Um, you've got uh, lower sense of body and weight, which suggests obviously characteristic of the wine based on all those things we talked about. If you remember those questions uh, that we yeah, asked a little bit earlier. Okay. So that's what so we there, got. There, there are questions, Evan. So Shoot. for a second. So. I want to, Jerry, I want to tell you that we'll address your question at uh, a little later. I'm going to go wine specific right now. Evan, this is from Benjamin. How do you know if it's been in neutral oak versus steel versus concrete? 
Well, stainless steel, um, and, and I'm going to take I'm going to take a, a perhaps semi contrarian side on concrete. Concrete and steel are both inert. Um, there are winemakers out there that will tell you that wine breathes through concrete. I don't actually believe that. I think concrete is important texturally and does bring out roundness in wine. And especially if you're fermenting in concrete, it mitigates the hot spots within the um, fermentation vessel, whereas other vessels um, tend to have hot spots and not. Um, stainless steel um, is basically a reductive environment. So you're not gonna pick up anything at all. When I'm saying it, I, I'm thinking that there's oak here, it's because there are elements of youthful color and wine, but nevertheless, there are notes of, of oxygen interaction, micro oxygenation, if you were through wood. Wood, of course, is porous where those other two aren't. Smaller barrels um, generally tend to have a lot of a lot more influence on the wine uh, than larger oak does. Uh, larger oak or wood in general is going to do two things. Number one, it is going to provide you that sort of micro oxygenative environment. And two, all wines that have spent time in wood tend to be rounder um, than wines, certainly that have spent time in stainless steel. And once again, um, round, but without any signs of oxidation might lead you to believe concrete. So because the oak is not giving me all of the classic vanillin, baking spice, torrefaction, caramel types of flavors, I'm reading into it that the oak here is probably not newer, it's probably older, and it's probably larger by virtue of the fact that the oxygenation is very soft and not very pronounced, like sherry or something. So I just want to, um, I put this in the chat as well. We have a diff, uh, we have a problem here on the poll. It's still showing France, even though we thought we changed it just before the session. Uh, where it says France, it should be Germany. So I'll give you guys another second if you want to uh, vote again and change that. But thank you for calling it out, Lisa. Uh, like I said, we had a little bit of technical difficulty here. Um, Evan, just Plus very Joe quick, Biden. <laughs> very quick, Evan, uh, 10 second, 15 second explanation if you can. Um, is there a difference between, how do you compare between Shannon and Gavutz? Well, Gewurz demeanor is extraordinarily aromatic. It is in your face. It is dancing with a lampshade on its head, um, giving you the sort of sweet spice element, the strong floral elements, which come from the terpenes in the wine, rose petals, very aromatic flowers and all that. And um, Chenin Blanc is really about a similar character a fruit, you know, they can both have sort of that riper apple type of character, but without all of the spice. It's a little bit more tropical, maybe subtler, maybe a little bit more juicy fruit gum, and certainly not as brightly rosy florally as Gewurz. Great, great. All right, I think we're ready to just go on this first one. We'll catch up on the questions. There are lots of good questions, so we'll keep this moving as quickly as we can. All, all right. right. Get in the virtual so reality ride. Let's leave San Francisco today, which is where I am, and let's move. And we're going up, up, up. Don't look up. All right. That was a movie, right? And we're moving. Um, we're leaving uh, the Bay Area. We're leaving California. It looks like we might be even leaving America. And we're moving around and we're going due east, east, east. We're staying apparently in the Northern Hemisphere. And as we land, uh, we're landing down in what looks to be Germany. And we're landing specifically in the Nahe region of Germany, um, which is located not super far away as we'll see in the map in a minute from some other well-known areas. But the Nahe is probably one of my favorite areas. We tend to think mostly in sort of Mosul and Rhine, Gau, Hessen, you know, Hessen and all those other things. But I'm a big Nahe fan. think it should get a little bit more love than it does. And we're at the Weingut Paul Anheuser. And this is a, a lovely property, as we'll see. If we can move to the next slide, we can look at the map and see where we are. Oops, we can, or we can go again because the ride no, is so no, no, fun. No, it's trying to move it. You can never go. Trying enough. to move. You can it. never go enough. But you'll see there that the Nahe is located it's just sort of north, uh, and you know, on, on a similar uh, longitude to that of the uh, Rhine Hessen, they do share some character to it. Although somebody pointed out um, there was sort of a Moselle-esque character, which I can concur certainly from structure uh, that you'll find there at times. I'm gonna defer to Tim later. He's much more the Germany guy than us and far away from Hessisch Bergstrasse in the Far East, which is old East Germany. But it's a really neat area. And pa Paul Anheuser, uh, the wine gut, the winery itself is a, a relatively new winery. It was, uh, goes back 14 generations having been established in 16. 
52 uh, in this part of the world. And um, as I said before, the Anheuser name right off the bat, if you're sitting here and you're trying to, to, to make any connections here, yes, the Anheusers um, going back to the 1800s, a gentleman by the name of Eberhard Anheuser uh, emigrated from uh, Germany, landed in the United States, settled in St. Louis. His daughter mentioned, uh, married a guy named Adolphus Bush, and together they formed Anheuser-Busch and became the largest brewer in the United States. So you actually have this tie that goes back as beer does to Germany, to wine, Germany, St. Louis, all these other things. It's very, very cool. So um, within uh, the Nahe, uh, Schloss Buckelheim is a unique, uh, very different sort of soil area, very steep, like a lot of the other German areas. But what's interesting about the soils here is they tend to be red. And they're red for two reasons. Number one, they're volcanic. And number two, they've got sort of a red slate to them. So it gives them um, a very different look and feel there. And I don't know if that's turning leaves or combinations of red slate and stuff like that, but it definitely at least speaks to the, the, the area here. It definitely adds a different different um, element here. This particular vineyard uh, called Koningsfell, which is actually a monopole. Many vineyards, as you know, are co-produced uh, very much like in Burgundy by lots of producers, but the Koningsfell, which means King's Field, is a monopole or owned exclusively by uh, the Paul Anheuser family, which I think is really interesting. Nahe wines always do have a slightly sort of sweet, spicy element there. So if you were kind of leaning Gewürzy a little bit, I oftentimes do pick up some of those sweet baking uh, spice notes, not wood oriented, but actually varietally oriented. Uh, in that case, that that are, br are the brothers. Uh, Paul Anheuser here is obviously, it just his name's coincidental. That's not the same Paul Anheuser from which the winery is named. That guy's long gone, but uh, currently Paul and Rudolph kind of run the winery together. They're doing a terrific uh, job on it. And um, yeah, that's what I got. It's cabinet style uh, wine. So it's going to be a little bit off dry. Um, I, and I think what's most interesting about this, and we were having this conversation at, at uh, work recently with some of the team, is there are two distinctive camps in Germany today. And I think what's really important is that you recognize the difference between sort of the modern stainless steel, bright, austere, lean, shrill camp of uh, of uh, Germany. And those that are the OGs, you know, the OGs long before there was stainless steel fermentation, they used big old vats and they actually let the wine stay on the leaves and they made these sort of very creamy, richer styles. So you get a little bit of that kind of honey and honeysuckle floral element. You get that generous fruit, but the wine has texture and round. So some people will think that the wine's actually sweeter than it is based on the texture. They actually think it's more almost spate like although by an Uxla level, Level, this is a definite cabinet wine and I think nicely representative. Evan, so here's a good question um, about this whole two types of Riesling from Jerry. He's mm. asking that he didn't get the TDN. Do you get the TDN and, and do we expect the TDN here? TD, I'm going to let I'm going to let Tim talk about TDN. TDN is mm -hmm. directly correlated to the amount of sunlight that hits the Riesling grapes, the amount of heat. Um, it takes time to develop in some parts of the world. It's very apparent in some parts of the world based on the same. But Tim, I thought you saw I, I saw you make the un poquito thing, and I think there is un poquito of that diesely petroly thing here, but it's not yeah. driving the wine. Go ahead. No, and you know uh, uh, TDN. The compound, it doesn't uniformly appear in all Rieslings. And Evan, to your point, where it does appear often, even in young wines, is in places that have shorter, warmer, sunnier growing cycles, like Australia and like Austria and certain other places. Um, you know, the Naha is, is one of my favorite regions in Germany as well. I mean, if you're in the Rheingau and you're looking south across the Rhine River, you're looking at uh, the Rheinhessen, and then right over here, right next to it, literally, a stone's throw, is the Naha. And the Naha happens to have some of Germany's top 10 producers, and Dönhoff especially, some people think is the greatest winery in Germany. I have, it's hard to argue that. Uh, and I agree, Evan, you said it's kind of a cross between Rheingau and Mosel Rieslings in that it has delicacy, but the wines are not as opulent and rich as the Rieslings from the Rheingau. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, they're intensely mineral driven. And also to your point, yeah, there's a little spice character that I find in them too. Yeah. 
Great stuff. Well, and with, and the, the other, yeah, no, the only other thing I would add that I'm looking back quickly at my notes that I did, mentioned is that while it's not a rain shadow, this is actually a relatively dry region in comparison. It's got it gets protection mm -hmm. from both the Rheingau and the Unsruck uh, mountain yeah. range. So um, it's yeah. a, it has a sort of mini rain shadow. You could call it that. I, I, yeah. I love our I love our MTW community. Jerry says he's reading a publication out of Cornell that when you can detect petrol, which is the TDN that we're talking about. There is a 96% chance that the grape is Riesling. That's an interesting stat. Well, unless it's an old uh, Grunewald leaner, yeah. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, TDN is in trace amounts in several grapes besides Riesling. Great, so. great. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage folks who are new to us. This conversation gets gets going. It's really hard to keep everybody on track. I'm gonna move everybody along to wine number two, but do stay for the happy half hour if we weren't able to answer your question. We try to get 90 minutes of straight up the six wines and then stay for half, half hour if you want to voice up uh, additional uh, questions. All right, Tim, you're up sure next. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Lee Meng. So everybody just taking a look at wine number two versus one. We got uh, we got a wine that's yellow in color versus straw in the Riesling. Okay. So right away you should be thinking, okay, what's uh, what's the deal? What's the cause behind it? And it could be that the wine is simply older. Yeah, it's been in bottle longer, or it was in oak for an extended period of time, or there's been skin contact, which would definitely lend some color to it, or uh, what else? There could be extended leaves contact, or the fruit could be botrytis infected. All those things. So we're going to figure out if the wine's all pretty quickly as soon as we smell it, or if there's oak on it, right? So with mm -hmm. that, we're going to call this wine medium yellow. Notice there's still some green in it. Uh, what else about it? It is clear. It is very bright, star bright. And then the tears, legs, viscosity, Marangoni effect are somewhere between medium plus and high. So that tells me that either A, the alcohol is elevated. We're going to figure that out if there's ripe fruit or maybe there's some residual sugar as in the last wine, all right? So let's go ahead and everybody smell. Okay, that's very interesting. So my first inclination is the one, which is the wine is riper. So warmer climate wine versus the Riesling that we just tasted. And not only that, but there's the interesting thing is that there's a whole panoply of different kinds of fruit, different categories. So if we start with the orchard fruit, which is apple and pear, the fancy way of saying it, yeah, there's both here and, and they're really ripe and they're yellow versus green. So again, it's a warmer place, warmer vintage. Uh, there's also sweet citrus like Meyer lemon and mandarin, maybe a little regular lime too. Um, there's also tropical fruit, which is really ripe and kind of like in the mango and pineapple range. And then finally in the uh, pit fruit, stone fruit, there's a yellow peach and yellow nectarine and maybe even a bit of apricot. So this is very curious to me that we've got all these different categories of fruit. Uh, the last one would be melon. Yeah, maybe there's a little green melon in it, but the most important thing is that all these fruits are really ripe. Some of them even are like they're baked. The apple to me comes across as baked yellow apple. Beyond that, if you get your nose out of the glass, the wine's quite floral, yeah? There's honeysuckle, there's citrus blossom, uh, there's a little jasmine too. So hmm, what does that make me think? The combination of that much floral with the stone fruit and the sweet citrus to me is an aromatic grape variety. Hmm. We'll see if that's true. What else about this? There is some herbal type things in it like lemon verbena, uh, a little ginger root. There's also some, uh, what else? There's even a little bit of saffron. Hmm. And that's very interesting. That's almost a botrytis marker. What else am I missing here? Verbena, maybe a little bit of fennel, you know? And then in, once we get into what we would call the earth and mineral range, there's a little white mushroom. And uh, I don't think there's soil so much that I'm getting today. There is some mineral, but for me, what's driving the wine is all this cornucopia of fruit that I'm smelling. Uh, there's definitely some low use of oak here. It's used. Um, I get it in the form of slight spice, little toast, uh, more like oxidation, like almond skin, walnuts, almost peanut brittle, things like that. So there's definitely some yew oak. And then let's go ahead and taste it. Mm. I like how you got all that just from smelling, Tim. 
Well, the nose doesn't lie, and that's where you do most of your work. I love it. <laughs> you, what, when you taste it with enough practice, by the time you get to taste it, you're confirming what you just smelled. And if things change, which they usually do, and then you're assessing the structure. Uh, that's very interesting. I'm getting alcohol. So I don't know about you, you know, in the Riesling, the alcohol was missing in action. It turns out to be nine and a half. I don't even think it's that high. It's a nine. But whenever I, you know, I spit the Riesling out and I said, oh, and inhale, it's like I got nothing. Maybe a little heat right here. This I'm feeling down in here. So here, I, yeah, I don't know what it says on the bottle, but this is like over 14%. So this is bordering on high, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and the wine goes right along with it because you've got a deeper color, pro probably because of the yolk, but also the ripeness of the fruit, but also just it's riper. The alcohol is higher. Okay, so the most important thing here I'm getting is the structure is, again, the acid is balanced. It's medium plus. I'm salivating, right? Mm -hmm. And then the alcohol, if I go, I can hear it, feel it right down in here. So that to me is bordering on high, probably around 14%. And then there's obviously no tannin. You're not going to get tannin in white wine unless you have something in oak for a long time. And then it is tannin, tannic from the oak. But what I do get is I get phenolic bitterness. And I would say kind of like medium minus, but it's there. It's, it tastes like almond skins and there's a little bit of astringency. And that to me, again, is the marker for an aromatic grape. Okay. All Great. right. Other things we need to talk about. I think it has a medium plus the long finish. And definitely it's tending towards high in complexity. There's a lot going on in the glass. This is really a well-made wine. Okay. So here we have, uh, here we have our, uh, the contestants that you can vote for. Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio, okay? Uh, there, the, you know, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris, a semi-aromatic grape. The Pinot Gris, if it's from Alsace, is a pretty weighty wine like this. Uh, that's actually pretty, it's usually richer than this. Sometimes a little bit of residual sugar, more phenolic bitterness, higher alcohol, and just a more declarative statement of a wine. Pinot Grigio from Alto Adige, much more delicate, restrained, Still a little bit of flowers, a little bit of phenolics, you know, 13% alcohol. Uh, a Rhone blend, weighty, rich, the phenolics, alcohol, a lot of different kinds of fruit. The Semillon blend to me has that waxy texture, usually a little bit of a sulfur note that we call Mercaptan. And if it's got Sauvignon Blanc in it, it's got pyrazines, okay? So we got the bell pepper thing going on. All right, with that, Tim, we have a question here that's, um, I don't know how you would answer this one. Let's see. Uh, from Lisa, you said that the fruit here is underripe. I think some of the descriptors were, or not. Uh, no. How no, does it? To me, everything about this uh, number two, the wine, the fruit is ripe and baked. Right. Uh, and wine number one, different story. Cooler mm -hmm. climate, higher acid, less alcohol. The fruit tends to be underripe. So if I okay. mix those two up, my apologies. Okay, great, great. I love uh, Andrea's call on tarragon. That's definitely this herbal quality on it. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, I see the early results coming in, Tim. People are kind okay. of undecided about the region. Maybe a little hint on how to decide between regions here. Well, okay, so, <laughs> you know, you gotta obviously take the grape variety first and say, well, all right, where's Waldo? Where do they grow it? And certainly Pinot Gris yeah, kind of grown in Germany, in, in Southern Germany in the fall, it's a little bit, not much. So we're gonna rule that out. Greece, I don't think anything there is grown in Greece. So if it is, it's in trace amounts. New Zealand, they make Pinot Gris there. It's a very bright, high acid stainless steel version of it. And then Simeon Blend could be Washington state. In fact, that's one of the first white wines it became famous for the state. And uh, otherwise, you'd be in France, right? Okay. So, so I guess what is what is helpful when, as Benjamin's asking, didn't taste any terroir, you know? Okay. So, Benjamin, I would have to ask you, what do you mean by terroir? Because terroir can mean many things. If you're talking about, does it taste like earth and mineral? Uh, you know, I'd have to agree. There's there's a little bit of terroir, and uh, and we're looking for it. It comes sequentially. I don't know how you want to think about this, but after you experience all the fruit, that next wave of impressions, be they herbs, spices, or whatever, it's in that mix. 
And does the wine have the texture of minerals? Does it taste and smell like, you know, potting soil and mushrooms and truffles and things like that? So if that's what you refer to, I would agree. I think you're right. There isn't a lot here, uh, which is very important when you talk, try to drive this thing home, okay? So for those of you who picked other, um, there's 27% of you. It would be really helpful for you to tell us where else you're picking for other. And in the meantime, uh, we'll reveal and you guys, we can talk about your uh, selections in a little bit. All right, here we go. <laughs> in the way back machine. We're Meeting going Germany. from Germany. By Germany. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Okay, and we're going and we're going and we're gonna go across this, the Atlantic. And there we are. Through the magic Someone said the uh, that they, they called New World. I think it was Kristen. Great job on that. Okay, here we are at the Hedges Family Estate, which is in Eastern Washington, probably near Yakima. Okay, so this, you know, in terms of getting there to a place in the conclusion is by default. It's literally process of elimination. There is really nowhere else to go because I think I made a point of saying there's really not much earth and mineral in this wine. So in style, it is a new world style wine using Rhone varieties, okay? And obviously this is Washington State. This is Hedges Family Vineyard. Uh, Tom and Emery Hedges founded the winery in 1987. Originally, it was uh, they were in a go shop. They were selling wines to Europe and, and also the Far East. Uh, they were selling wines to China and Hong Kong and places like that. And then in 89, they started to make their own wine. They built a winery. And, you know, I remember Hedges Family Wines, you probably do too, Evan, from maybe 20 years ago yeah, as being yeah. really, really some of the first best examples of Cabernet and Cabernet blends. And then also being impressed a few years after by the Syrah, which I think is really good. I think that part of Eastern Washington, you have really old, poor soils and high elevation, and it's great for Rome varieties. And hey, what do we have here? We have a blend of Viognier and Marsan. The Marsan in this wine gives it the color because Marsan oxidizes pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the weight and you know the really ripe uh, orchard fruits. And then the Viognier, of course, gives it all the grace and elegance, the perfume, the high tone floral qualities and the phenolic bitterness. So it's kind of the best of both of those worlds and really an impressive wine to me. Yeah. So Evan, what do you think? No, I, I was gonna say, you know, when we were, I was actually up in the, uh, Russian River yesterday doing a, a tasting thing and we, it was about Pinot Noir but we talked so much about texture you know and mm. and one of the things that I think is a hallmark of this wine and a hallmark of, of many Rhone white wines is that sort of creaminess the roundness yep. to the wine that there's as much pleasure in just enjoying it as it moves around your mouth as there is in the lifted flavors. I like, you know, I think to your point, that I echo your comment of it being sort of the, the best of both worlds because Marsan is known for its fat. You know, it's a it's a fat, yeah. very rich variety. It doesn't have necessarily a lot of flavor going on. Although, you know, you look right. at places around the world, like I don't know, Chateau Talbic in Australia, they make a pretty personality filled Marsan, but that's more the exception than the rule. But then you get the lift from the Viognier, all of those florals, all those tropical, uh, notes that you're doing and you sort of mash them up together and you, you end up with a wine like this, which is really deftly handled. Um, obviously, you get texture from the varieties, you get texture from uh, older wood, you get texture from some Lee's contact. And it's um, it's also nice because it's not over the top. You know, so many times Viognier driven wines can be like, you know, Walgreens princess shampoo. You know, they just have that really over the top. Walgreens princess shampoo. I yeah, love it. exactly. You know, the stuff that you give your daughter to take a bath. And, oh, can I pull the head off? Look at that, right? Um, and this is subtler. It's more elegant. It's more restrained. So it's yeah. at once exuberant, but in a sort of quiet way. Um, I think it's definitely done. Yeah. And I concur with you. My very first trip um, to Washington decades ago, one of the stops we made was visiting with Tom Hedges and having dinner with him. And yeah. he was ahead of his time in many regards. Yeah. All right, guys, we have a you lot know, of questions. about this that could be uh, answer your texture question. And this was in the tasting notes. And I found it really humorous is that they pointed out that, you know, of course, the grapes of this, they only made about 400 cases of this 
and uh, the grapes are hand harvested. But then on harvest day, they had the tasting club show up and, and the grapes were trod with foot. So I, maybe that's the texture we're talking uh -huh. about. Maybe that's the bitterness. So um, Tim, uh, we have questions, two comments about bitterness. One yeah. from Anthony asking what causes the bitterness. I think you talked a little bit about phenolics, but maybe you can explain that a little bit more. Yeah. But also um, Andrea had a point there that because of the bitterness on the finish, she thought that um, it didn't have as much Viognier as it did. So what are your thoughts on bitterness? Okay, so first, you know, the, the chance of the question about phenolics. So phenolics is a big family of over 300 chemical compounds, right? Uh, and tannins are in that family of chemical compounds. So they belong to the su their subset of the family of phenols. So phenols are found in grape skins and in uh, pulps and the seeds, and the seeds primarily in the skins. So if there is skin contact and you have a high level of phenols and not all grape varieties are, are equal when it comes to having phenols in the skin. Some have less, Chardonnay, not nearly as much. Riesling, not as much, right? Uh, Melon for Muscadet, not as much. Aromatic grape varieties, Viognier, uh, Muscat, Gewürztraminer, Torrentes, a lot. Uh, Semi-aromatic grape like Marsan, quite a bit, not as much as an aromatic grape. And it, it tastes like an almond skin, tastes bitter, and it feels a little bit astringent like tannin because, again, it's related to. Uh, to answer the other question about so much Viognier in it, uh, bitter nuts, especially the finish, was surprised they had so much Viognier. Well, yeah, I mean, Andrea, you know, Viognier has quite a bit of phenols in it, so it's going to be fairly bitter. It really is. And, uh, you know, in the designer versions that we all love and can't afford from Condrieu because they're now so expensive, more often than not, they're aged in burgundy cooperage. So not only do you have the bitterness, but you've got all this really uh, attracted oak trappings like spice and vanilla and things like that. All right, very quickly, Roussan, what does it really do to a blend? This is a great question from Kristen. Uh, we add Roussan because, okay, I, was, I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to say it. So, you know, to Evan's point, Marsan, it's, um, I don't know, I call it the unfinished bedroom set that's wooden, you know, because more often than not, it's blocky, it's two by four. And that's why you add stuff to it, right? Because what it does, it will give you richness and texture, but not a lot of personality. Right, there are jokes there, but we're going to pass by. What Roussan does, it adds acid, it adds bright fruit, it adds floral qualities, and it adds interest. And that's why there's such a good match together. And also why you see usually in a Marsan Roussan blend that you've got 80% Marsan and 20% Roussan. That is a good recipe for you know blends, and you see it often. You used awesome. to see you used to before we jump into wine three. You used to see a lot more Roussan, but they had. Um, uh, a lot of issues with disease in France earlier mm. on. The blends up north used to be actually more Roussan than Marsan, and um, it's gone the other way. Now there's virtually minimal uh, Roussan up north. And you see more of the Roussan down south. Actually, if you spend time yeah. in the Southern Rhone, you go to Costier de Nîmes, you go to Luberon, you go to places like that. There's fairly high amounts of Roussan there. And Roussan's much sexier. Marsan's just there. Um, it gives you texture, it gives you body, but Roussan gives you that. And, and the classic flavor that the French tell you, the French always have these little things is white cherries albino cherries oh. are the flavor of Roussan nice. so go figure like it. Um, um so Jerry I'm going to skip that question about quick picks and where you see these great varieties uh towards the end when we catch up Evan we'll need to catch up a little bit on wine number three so that we're, we're not so fine. far behind on four we're five good. six yeah we're so, good so, okay Let's keep going. Yes. So, so what's interesting here is you look at the the grapes. The grapes are are dark, but this is a rosé. So obviously, rosés are generally then made from dark grapes. We just pressed it a little earlier and get it. So, a rosé is oftentimes judged by its color. So that's something to always pay attention to. There are different styles of rosé, and colors will often dictate provenance based on what their sort of uh, design or epitome is. Um, always worth asking again if there's earthiness or not. New world, old world clues, and again, climate as related. So I look at this wine right off the bat and it's got a lovely sort of salmon pinkish color it's quite bright it's quite reflective um and 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 quite sort of showy and, and all that what i like about this wine is it sort of it splits the difference because sometimes these days they're so pale that you can barely tell that they're rosés and that seems to be a trend one that i don't like a lot and then in some parts of the world they are they are almost like soft reds more in a claret 
a clarette, clarette sort of style. And this one pulls a difference. It's Tim's favorite color of sort of salmon, salmon verging on, on orange, uh, but it's got expression and in large part that's gonna be probably due to both style of production as well as the grape types that are there. As I swirl it around, um, the tears are moderate. The uh, viscosity on the wine is moderate and uh, there's nothing floating. There's nothing there. And it does reflect light again, sort of in that very star bright vein. Um, in the nose, in my FEW, Fruit Earth Wood, this wine has um, a lot of of uh, fruit to it. The fruit here is an interesting combination of sort of some citrus fruits on the sweeter side, uh, tangerines, oranges, mandarins, uh, satsumas, if you will. Then you've got a little bit of that sort of tartar element. There's almost like a blood orange character to the wine. And then you've got this lovely core of red fruit underneath, sort of uh, strawberry, raspberry, maybe a little bit of pomegranate underneath there. Then it sort of moves into a slight tropical thing where I'm getting just a kiss of, uh, of melon and uh, maybe a little bit of guava or something like that there. And then um, herbs, you know, there's an interesting combination of herbs, even some slightly bittery kind of herbs, not super bitter, but but they're there and very, very pronounced. And um, maybe just a little hint of watermelon. I guess that's in the melon vein of things as well too. Lightly herbal, quite fresh. And then, which is gonna lead me to believe on the wine style of production, it is slightly um, reductive. And we can address that a little bit later, but there is a, a sort of closed, uh, thing there that gives you a sensation of um, it's almost a sort of sulfury thing. And yes, it'll it'll blow off in about 15 or 20 minutes. And the more you do the glass, but by definition, as a rosé, you want to produce the wines in as oxygen free an environment as humanly possible to preserve the fruit and to uh, elongate its lifetime. If you made it in a more oxidative style, it would have a shelf life of about 60 days, and then it would turn into a sort of very um, unpleasant kind of wine. A little bit of earthiness, and then in the palate. The wine is bright, it's lean, uh, it's a little bit austere. It too is a touch phenolic or a little bit bitter as Tim mentioned, picking that up in the finish, obviously being made um, almost primarily, as we'll find out later out of red grapes, you're expecting a certain amount of tannins to provide you some phenols there. All of those flavors that we talked about before, the red fruit, the ripe citrus fruit, um, all jump out there, the tropical fruit, although the tropical fruit comes off a little bit more underripe uh, in the mouth. Um, it does have a definitive minerality to it, which is to me mineral here is not so much stoniness per se, but it's sort of a combination of, of, of actual grit, not phenol, not bitterness, but an actual almost like powderiness um, in the mouth here. That's usually a clue to me of, uh, of minerality, a very soft minerality in this case. Fairly long finish, very fresh, which is what I always look for in my rosés. And all I'm craving right now is a little bit of food because this is a very food friendly style of wine. Great. Evan, there's a quick question here. Grit, you just said. Grit, yeah, grit, is, grit is tannin. You know, tannins can range from sort of firm to soft to hard to grippy to gritty to transparent. And this wine to me has just a little bit of a, a sort of, you know, grip is hard. Grip is when it clamps down on your mouth and you know that. Grit is just, you know, this is sort of, it's sort of that soft sort of thing. Some people might describe them as powdery tannins or something like that. It's just sort of a, a soft. So um, that would be there. And when I said it in the context of mineral, I meant that mineral to me, it, looking at it, not so much from the taste component of river rock or slate or rocky, but actually the feel component, because to, uh, because minerality is as much to me about, about texture as it is about taste. Grape varieties, what do we got here? Well, we've got Tempranillo as a blend. Oftentimes parts of the world where Tempranillo can make delightful uh, rosés or rosados, depending on what part of the world you are. Grenache, of course, is a very traditional grape uh, for making um, rosés in many parts of the world, blended in a lot of different other things. Pinot Noir can be another one in a more Van Gris uh, style. And um, there you go. And then obviously associated countries with that. Tempranillo, of course, going to be most associated with uh, Spain, Granacha can come from any of those places, including Australia, ditto, 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 Pinot Noir can be found in all of them. Great, awesome. Um, well, we have a moment here for people to answer um, these questions. Jerry, I wanted to get back to the question from the last wine. Um, the question was the this guessing sort of style of the varieties and regions is very helpful and it would be nice to do it at home and Jerry, Congratulations and thank you, Evan. I think Jerry gets the Star Student Award. He's tasting the night before and doing his homework before he comes on to the webinar. Love it. 
Um, so if you're doing that and you want the hens ahead of time, we do put them in the tasting grid that's online. You can have it in two places. You can do the full workout. And when you get to the varieties part, you can click on the little question mark or a hint uh, thing, and it will give you four choices over there. Or you can do quick picks. And in quick picks, you will have the guessing game of four varieties, four regions, and four vintages, if you will. So they're both in the full workout as hints or in the quick picks. If you were to do this, just know, sometimes we make it harder here than we do at home. Because here you have Tim, Evan, Madeline to explain to you the difference between Sangiovese and Tempranillo. So we don't make it so hard for people. Sometimes we do give a couple of guineas on those hints at home. So I hope that helps. Okay, I'm gonna share the results, Evan, and let's see. Uh, Grenache mm -hmm. is definitely leading, leading pack here with 77 mm -hmm. and France. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously I think for most people they associate Grenache with France, although the grape is also from and originated in Spain. So those people that ended up thinking it was more of a Garnacha style from Nevada or Campo de Borja or somewhere up in Aragon, um, you're probably not, you're not, you could not be off to if, if Grenache was the grape you chose. Tempranillo uh, tends to be very um, more angular, a little bit spicier, not necessarily quite as fleshy and full body. But again, if it was blended with a lot of something else, it might soften it, but then it would be perhaps more of a Grenache blend than not. Pinot Noirs tend to be very lean, austere. They also tend not to have as much color as this. Pinot Noir, when vinified, as a rosé, as a van gris, tends to be almost absent of color. And then um, other, there are lots of other grapes that are made into rosé. Malbec is made into a rosé, probably deeper color than this. Uh, Syrah can be made into a rosé, deeper color than this. Cabernet can be made into a rosé, deeper color. So where are we? I'm trying to close this out here. We're moving, we're leaving Washington State. Bye-bye, Tom. Bye-bye, Hedges. Bye-bye, Yakima. And we're up high. And we're staying north. And it looks like we're a ping pong ball so far. By the way, nobody has commented on my orange Halloween cupped theme. Nobody. Just thought I would point that Only out. Only if you had showed up in costume, Evan. Yeah, I know. Next, hey, next time we'll do it on Halloween. <laughs> Actually, a Halloween tasting, yep. 2023. We should do we that. Should. We All should. right, we're landing. We're down. We're, if you looked, if you were following that on time, we ended up in France. And we're located down south in France. We're down in the area. Thank you for the happy Halloween in Provence. Uh, and specifically, although it's kind of hard to tell by this particular uh, Google Earth, you're not really that far away from the Mediterranean and from the water. Um, we're actually in uh, Provence. We're, we're not far from Saint-Tropez, as you can see there from the map. And uh, this is truly the heart of Provence. And Provence, of course, and Rosé are knee-jerk associated. It is one of the largest producers of Rosé in the entire world uh, and is the largest producer of Rosé in France, which makes it the largest producer of Rosé in the world. Um, and the U.S. has a um, an un, un satiable um, love of these wines. In fact, after France, we are the number two market for Provençal Rosé, which a lot of people probably didn't know, but we love its refreshing character, its light color, it's when it's made well, um, its ability to sort of cross over and go with so many uh, foods with it. And it generally can be a blend. Obviously the blends um, are going to change basically, basically based on where they're from. Uh, this particular wine, uh, while it is not it's technically, theoretically, I'm going to say I fudge this one a little bit. It's a Sanso blend, but if I had put Sanso blend, I don't think anybody would have gotten it. And also it has, even though there's about 44% um, Sanso and only about a third Garnache in it, the Garnache actually dominates in this one. I mean, I think you get a little bit of the spiciness here, but the nature of the fruit, uh, the, the, the watermelon-y character, that sort of strawberry raspberry character um, actually leads me to believe that they're playing it up. And it leads me to believe that the percentages might in fact be a little bit off. So it's 44% Sanso, 23% Grenache, 11% more Vedra, which is more of a bundle Provence thing, 9% Hol, which is the Vermentino grape, as we know, and then a little bit of Syrah for structure back there. Uh, the uh, Chateau or the Chateau, the property La Bernard is unique. You can sort of see, you can actually see a little bit in the background of the water, just sort of way in the far the distance fog, there. Yeah. But it's, uh, but it is uh, unique in the fact that it is a hundred percent estate. Um, that is rare mm. in Provence where everything is purchased, negotiate, bought, usually made into bulk stuff that respectfully 
uh, falls apart in about six months, which is why you can always find the vintage Priors uh, Rosé sold cheap at the beginning of the year. Great for Frosé, uh, but not necessarily good for, for high-end drinking. Uh, these come off of southeastern facing slopes at 1,150 feet uh, above sea level. It actually gets snow pretty frequently in December, not a lot, but trace amounts. Um, it has strong thermal amplitude, long growing season, clay limestone soils. And this to me, what I like about it, this is what in my mind's eye, it should be about. This is what, if all Provencal rosés were like this, I would be a much happier camper. I think they're unfortunately in the minority. I think a lot of them are pushed out for volume uh, to, quaff, to, to sort of quaff this uh, thirst there. And they're kind of, they become sort of the Pinot Grigio of rosés. Pinot Grigio, of course, being Italian by and large for no flavor. Uh, most of the rosés coming out of Provence uh, on my bully pulpit here are relatively personality-less, pink, but watery. This wine has tons of personality to it. Lots going on. Uh, this is the harvest there. And it's direct press, which is to say it's not saignade. So they're not actually making um, red wine and then pulling off, uh, bleeding off the vat and then vinifying the rosé that comes off the vat and making a red wine here. Literally all of the fruit here is collected, vinified, um, and then pressed quickly when they hit the color that they want. It's a very old but classic technique uh, and one that is used um, well in Provence. Obviously it's done quickly because colors are usually pretty um, pretty muted as opposed to a place like say Tavel where the maceration pre-direct press might be you know 48 hours here you could be literally you know 12 or something eight is, is that why it's lighter is, that's is why that... it's lighter in color absolutely the white gray it's not that it's light because it has nine percent white wine on it um because all the rest of the fruit is red but it's basically uh pressed as the color they achieve is there uh the question that inevitably somebody's going to ask is do they vinify the grape variety separately and all of that i don't know the answer and it's not available to me my experience in parts of the world where they do direct pressing is that they if they pick various grapes together as they come in ripe, press it, and then make a blend rather than doing each grape individually because mm -hmm. they'd have to hold them too long based on the length of the harvest. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and is is that direct press uh, something that's common in Provence? Yeah, no, I would say. Or... I, yeah, I, I would say in as you in, in in Provence, it's probably the technique of choice. Uh, mm -hmm. As you move that's further helpful. eastward, uh, westward rather, towards the Rhone, towards Languedoc, and places like that, oftentimes they will send yay because they make a lot of red wine and they will use it. And they basically, it's both a commercial uh, benefit to you to do that, and it also does the benefit of concentrating the red wines more. So that's mm -hmm. more of a, a technique used further to the west. Mm -hmm. and, uh, not that the Rhone isn't technically part of Provence per se, but further uh, further uh, west. Yeah. All right. Wine number four. All right. Now for the first of the three red wines. Um, yeah. So wine number four in terms of what it looks like. It's uh, a very deep ruby red. It's got a really bright fuchsia, purple pink rim, relatively young. Uh, I can still eh, not quite see through so in terms of a grape variety, is it a lighter pigmented grape variety like Pinot Noir or is it Syrah Cabernet? I think it's somewhere in between, tending towards a deeper pigmented grape. Uh, the wine does stay in the glass a little bit. The tears, legs, viscosity, et cetera, medium plus, and you can see a little bit of color, yeah. And then on the nose, ah, so there's a lot, a lot going on. Okay, uh, several different kinds of fruit and on red wines, they tend to go category of fruit first as in red, uh, black, blue and dry. Here, predominantly red fruit, but ripe red fruit, some of it even baked and dry. Things like strawberry, uh, cherry, uh, cherry tomato. Um, and then there's dark fruit too, like dark plum, um, blackberry, black cherry. And then, uh, and those as well are ripe, and almost baked, yeah? So there's a lot of ripeness here. Um, and then there's floral characters when you pull your nose out of the glass. Yeah, there's both rose and lavender. And then we get to the other non-fruit stuff and there's quite a bit to talk about. There's, you know, the things that first popped out of the glass were things like black tea, even bergamot, like Earl Grey. There was chicory. Uh, what else? There is um, dark leafy greens like arugula and maybe mm. some capers. So there's a very savory quality to the wine. Uh, what else? Um, olives, olives, black olives. 
Uh, there's mushrooms, brown mushrooms, and black licorice. There's something that's really strong and black and seems almost bitter, and we'll see if that's there on the palate too. There's elements of both earth and mineral. The, the earth is probably turned soil, and again, leading back to that brown mushroom, uh, the mineral is kind of a wet stone. Uh, but this is also kind of a sanguine quality to the wine, right? And sanguine meaning blood-like or meat-like. There's kind of like dried blood or dried, you know, beef in it or something like that. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, leather as well. And then finally, the oak here, uh, if it's there, is used. So there's no new oak here. Uh, there's some smoke and toast and some oxidative nutty-like qualities to it. Uh, but, you know, nothing new. And then on the palate, Mm. Wow. And so the palate, we got all that stuff happening. The fruit to me generally tends to get tartar. Even the black fruit gets tartar. And remember I said, I mentioned chicory and black licorice. Both of those are bitter. And the finish on this wine is a little bitter. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I do feel some used oak in the back. Texture is kind of uh, like coffee. Uh, coffee grounds, things like that. The wine is earthier and a little bit more mineral on the palate. The sanguine notes, the, the like the leather and dry blood, etc., comes up. So uh, things that are not fruit really come up. And then the, the fruit itself just turns tartar. In terms of the structure, the acid's medium plus and maybe even a little higher than that. It's really bright, which explains why the uh, Fruit really turned up on the palate. The alcohol is medium at best, probably 13 and a half, maybe bordering on 14, but it's 13 and a half. And then the tannins, I'm getting both oak tannins and grape tannins, but I would say the tannin is medium plus. And again, I still feel that bitterness. It reminds me, I'm not going to tell you what it reminds me because you go down a rabbit hole. I don't want you to do that. Okay. <laughs> but the finish is long and this is a surprisingly complex wine. And I thought it would be just by the nose alone. Okay. So here are your contestants. All right, so we've got Syrah Syrah blend, okay, which does, and Syrah, of course, is noted for a sanguine, you know, gamey, earthy, dry blood, like, notes like that, but it also has other things as well. We have Pinotage, which it definitely has sanguine notes, and the mix of really tart and ripe and even dried fruit, and other notes as well. But, I, you know, we'll, again, when we reveal the envelope, we'll talk about what this is. And then finally, Zinfandel, which is usually more of a frat party experience in terms of ripeness and alcohol and, you know, that. <laughs> and very peppery and uh, sometimes like peach yogurt and uh, that kind of thing. Okay. And then your regions, you've got France, you've got Spain, Argentina, and South Africa. All right. So uh, why don't you cast your vote? Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of things to work with. So Tim, I have one question here, but I want to just make one quick comment. Um, you say this, uh, I think, at every web webinar that we've had, but it really behooves us all to compare the colors and the glasses. Mm -hmm. It's best if you're yeah. new to this to pour yeah. all these wines out in six different glasses, especially now you have oh, three yeah, yeah, reds yeah. here. Um, yeah. Just the look alone on the color and the edges of these three yeah. wines is remarkable. It's They are completely different. And that's a great point, Lee Min. Yeah. Okay. So the question here is, um, and I love this question from Benjamin, what is the difference? I know we've answered it a couple of different ways before in previous webinars, but here's, here's the definitive chance for you, Tim. What is the difference between wood versus grape tannins? Benjamin, brilliant question. You know what? I'm not going to answer it right now because one of the other two wines is going to be a primer that will answer your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So well, at the end on. of the flight, then if you still want to know, we'll go back to the wine in question and we'll do a little deep We're dive. headed in the happy half hour. And this yes. happens every time with the first red wine of the flight, you guys. People are really slow to answer the poll when we change color. I just want to remind everyone, Evan said this earlier on, it is anonymous. No one needs to know what you're guessing. I love the bold, brave souls who tell us what they're thinking, like Andrea. But if you don't want anyone to know, it's okay. Make a guess uh, out here. So please take a moment, just hit it. And you've got a 25% or 33% chance of getting it right here. 
Uh, we've got a couple of, I would have guessed Barbera. I would have guessed Cabernet. So Tim, why mm -hmm. is it not those things? Okay, I think we ought to reveal first and then talk about why okay. it's not. Okay. That's great. Let's do it. Might be helpful. All right. We're going to get in the bye space. Bye-bye, Saint-Tropez. Oh. <laughs> it's going to take about 15, 16 hours to get where we're going. It's going to... It's oh, here's the ocean long right long by there. Way. Yeah. Med yes. yeah the med we love the Mediterranean. Yes. And we're going to go the entire. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, goodness. Yes. We don't do this very often. I like this. Yeah. And there we are. We are in South Africa. We're near Cape Town. And we're in the Kennenkop estate, which is in Stellenbosch. And. Uh, you know, Canacop, certainly one of the most respected producers in South Africa, their first vintage, 73, La Liga family, really one of the pioneering families in Stellenbosch in that part of South Africa, which is Western Cape region. Um, and why don't we reveal the wine so we can talk about the grape. And so what we have here is, and maybe a first experience with this grape and wine for some of you, is we have some Pinotage, okay? So there we are in, in Stellenbosch. Uh, you know, probably 80% of the quality vineyards in South Africa and, and the country produces a lot of wine are within 100 miles of the coast because once you get inland, it's incredibly hot. And here we are, we've got a Pinotage. Uh, so Pinotage is a, a cross between Pinot Noir and Sanso. It was a guy, Dr. Abraham Perold, who did the cross in 1925, I think. It wasn't commercially produced till 1961. Forever and a day, it was, it was thought that Pinotage would be South Africa's really banner red wine. But over the years, there have been problems, especially in the vineyards with fan leaf roll, planting the grapes in the wrong place at altitude where they wouldn't ripen. And, and in the winery, it's a problematic grape because it will it needs air during fermentation, but at the same time, it will oxidize quickly. It's like mm -hmm. Mervedre or Monastrell in that way. And so, you know, a lot of examples over the years, at least when we tasted them, Evan, what, 25 years ago and, and et cetera, were, were really um, funky and stinky. And they were reductive in that they needed oxygen during fermentation. So they had sulfur compounds and they smelled like a lot of different things, okay? but none of those things were good. Well, you know, Canacop is one of the few producers who have known for a long time how to deal with it, you know, in the winery and in the vineyard too. And I think been really consistent with it. And the winemaker whose name is right down here somewhere, Avery Beeslar, I think is one of the best at it. And this is their mm -hmm. cadet, this is their second label. So this is not even their, you know, estate bottled stuff, much less the reserve stuff. And I think it's a really good example. But here to me, what's interesting for all of you to take in is that, you know, the wine has that bitterness to it. Uh, and that's the Senso. In fact, that, you know, somebody asked about the rosé. What, what did the Senso do? That was what Evan was talking about in terms of a little bit of phenolics on the finish. So Senso in Pinotage to me is kind of like adding Petite Syrah to Zinfandel because it gives it black licorice bitterness. And here to me, this is a very aromatic, complex grape that doesn't get a lot of love, but it also has a checkered past. <laughs> yeah. So Evan, thoughts on it? Yeah, no, I I, I love, you know, a Pinot, P, Pinotage deservedly got bashed for a long time, but it really wasn't its own fault. You know, the challenges we know, um, if you look politically and socially back at, at South Africa, was there were challenges. And for years, all of the South African wine was drunk in South Africa, less, you know, a few bottles that made it to the UK. So because of that, you develop cellar palate. And, you know, over time, people there learn that that's what, what Pinotage tastes like. And while you were being very generous and subtle around it, it was somewhere between a cross between rubber tires and roadkill. It was just mm -hmm. awful sort of stuff. And it was for a lot of reasons about vindicification. I've read theories about Britannomyces in the vineyard and all these other yeah. things, but over and, and having your fermentations not hot enough and all these things. But over time and led very much by people like Aubrey Bieslar, they figured out what it is best, how it does well. And there's actually a top 10 Pinotage 
of the year thing that's that's uh, voted on in South Africa. And inevitably, if you can get a hold of any of the bottles, they're always spectacularly wonderful wines. The challenge is, yep. along with Chenin Blanc, is that when people didn't like those wines originally for reasons of cellar palate and myopia and all that other stuff, they ripped it out of the ground and planted Chardonnay and Merlot and Syrah and all that, yep. many of which are very good. But the highest price per ton of, of fruit in South Africa is old vine Pinotage, followed by old vine Chenin Blanc. So it's amazing. And these are all very old vine wines, uh, not as old as the uh, namesake wines are, but it's a delightful introduction. I hope if nothing else, it makes you rethink your pre your prejudices against Pinotage to wanting to try a few more. And um, this was one that I had to sort of bag Li Meng for years. If, Let me put one Pinotage <laughs> in the program. Da, 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 da. And fortunately, we've had other people that need Pinotage in their program. Carrie is on your side, Evan. Carrie is I've never met a Pinotage you didn't like. Oh, okay. I love that. Oh. And Shannon's got a double dang on this. Um, here, guys, two questions. Number one, why was this wine not a Cabernet or a Barbera? Mm. Still need to answer that one. And then the second question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some time, Tim. Evan, we'll take you first. How would you pair with this Pinotage? Oh, Pinot, Pinotage, it depends. You know, the, the levels of spice, uh, sanguineness, as Tim said, you know, there's always sort of like a umami, soyish, beef jerky-ish element, or what they call in South Africa, biltong, which is beef jerky in South Africa, um, to it. So it does very well with meat. It does well with spicy things. It's not a very... It's not a very flexible wine and that I wouldn't have it with fish. Um, it overwhelms most poultry unless the poultry is powerful, like uh, squab or something like that. This is a wine that can hang with venison. This is a wine that can hang with lamb. This is a wine that can ham, hang with a lot of sort of the stewier one pot dishes, particularly the bigger ones. This particular one by Kanenkoff is a little bit rounder. So I, you could treat it a little bit more like, um, you know, a, a Merlot meets a Syrah or a Merlot meets a Rhone in that regard. But I would still look for more traditional, spicier, more rustic uh, red wine fare. I, I love how Kristen's called you out, Evan. She reminds us that we had a Pinotage six months ago. Mm -hmm. No, we, had, we did have a Taj. Taj yeah. was a different style of Pinotage. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, yeah, you're, you, know, I think it's a, you know, it's important just to, to point out now is that I think from time to time we'll mention, you know, that not everything that ends up in these kits ends up on exams. But everybody who's on some kind of exam track you know, to get a certification or whatever, what what you what you're in the process of of doing is learning how to judge quality, and, and so that when you go on to a job, and the job could be buying for a restaurant or a retailer or even working for an importer, is that you can judge quality. So something like Pinotage needs to be on your radar. Periodically, you need to revisit it and taste it and put it in your database. It's yeah. one of those things. Yeah. Or, or, or Tim, you just want to, life's too short for bad wine. You just want to drink good wine. You need to be able to judge for yourself, right? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, Tim, how is it not a Barbera or a Cabernet in, when, when, during the blind tasting? What would you say didn't give any of those uh, clues for that, those two great varieties? Mm, you know, because a Cabernet for this kind of weight is going to probably have some expensive oak on it. Yeah. Mm. More often than not, you know, a Cabernet with this much concentration is going to have oak and it's not going to have it's not going to be as herbal or it's certainly not going to be sanguine. Uh, in terms of the Barbera, again, the, the bar a Barbera is not savory like this uh, and it's also not bitter. It tends to be acidic uh, and depending on the style, if it's, you know, kind of a newer style that's done in stainless steel, it's brighter, it's fruitier, it certainly has elevated acidity, and it does have earth and probably mineral. It's just not savory like this. I mean, this, to me, the savory components here really set this aside. And, uh, and plus the bitter quality, you know, really sets it aside further. All right, we really, we really need to move to the next um wine yeah. we'll come back on the next the three questions that came at the end there because those are those are meatier um yeah. wine number five that's yeah you. no absolutely is again keep those questions in mind ask yourself self uh, as you're going through that but right off the bat as we look at this wine and this is you know juxtaposed against wine number 
uh, four, um, this is a very different thing. Number one, it's much more translucent. You can read through it. So there's not as much color concentration there, which suggests possibly a thinner skin grape or a different kind of grape. And also the color itself is very different. So this is more of what you would call that sort of classic garnet color, which is that transitional thing between being a red, if you will, and being a, an aged wine. Uh, the edges are more moving towards an orange or a rust character. So clearly this wine is a little bit older or it's dropped a lot of color if it's younger, but nevertheless, um, it, it has got a, it's got, got a definitively different, more mature looking appearance. When I swirl the wine around, um, it moves in the glass uh, fairly quickly. The viscosity is what I would call moderate. The tearing is moderate to moderate plus. And once again, it's pretty, fairly translucent. I can read through it. It's sort of like a, a cross between sort of a light, um, you know, a light version of a dark tea or or something like that. In the nose, right off the bat, um, I notice a combination of, of, of both fresh and dried elements here. Uh, the fruit character, as I look to it, it seems that more to me as being definitively red, uh, but again, sort of dried out. It's currants, it's plums, uh, it's cherry tomatoes. It's more savory than it is sort of ripe, sweet character of fruit. Uh, there is some some uh, cherries and 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 plums on the blackish side. Once again, not super sweet, uh, more savory, but also having sort of a desiccated, dried character there. Not to the point of being raisiny, if you will, but just uh, but just sort of dried. Maybe that's the nature of the variety. Maybe that's the nature of it being um, slightly older than not. Um, I'm also picking up subtle notes. There's sort of like an orange, a dried orange peel or orange uh, zest element to it. Uh, it's got uh, florals here, but the florals are dried, dried roses, uh, maybe a little bit of potpourri, something like that. Dried herbs, uh, again, that sort of chicory tea leaf thing that Tim talked about earlier, but also sort of like tomato leaf, sun-dried tomatoes, dried cherry tomatoes. I was just eating a bunch of cherry tomatoes earlier. Maybe it's got tomatoes on the brain um, and uh, and a spiciness to it. It's also got um, both red and black licorice, a soft fennel character and um, an earthy character. There's both a combination of sort of um, hard, hard dirt, uh, like sort of baked earth, baked dirt, a little bit dusty, and then sort of an undercurrent a sort of a, a slightly rocky uh, stoniness to it going on there, a lot going on. As far as the wood goes, this definitely comes off to me as having sort of oak and probably quality oak based on the pedigree of the wine, but it also comes off as being older. Uh, again, not providing you that sort of richness and sweetness of baking spices of, and, uh, you know, of overt vanilla and of overt butter, butterscotch or caramel or toffee or anything like that. Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, bitter, so more like cocoa powder rather than chocolate, cocoa nib rather than um, than uh, mocha or something like that. But it's there. It's subtle. And again, I, I think it's probably slightly older. lot going on here. This is a, a, a an incredibly complex nose. And when you say complexity, you could, well, how do you know something's more complex? If you're still talking about it and continuing to find more stuff going on, that by definition, as a complex wine. But I think what's interesting here is going to be the difference between what we're looking at, what we're smelling, and as you put it in your palate, as they said in the first Back to the Future, hello, McFly. Um, wow, there's a, there's a lot going on here. First off, uh, the acidity here is bordering on a high to bracing level. The tannins here are grippy. Um, I think time based on the color has softened them in terms of their absolute hardness, but the wine is still astringent. And when I say astringent, it means that the saliva in my mouth is literally drying out as I am talking to you. So it is a, a, a drying wine, it's an astringent wine, it's a, it's a phenolic tannic wine in that respect, but the tannins have been somewhat mitigated by, I believe in this case, some age. The acid is high, the finish is long. The body weight is medium to medium plus. My chest cavity is warm, but not overly hot. Um, the finish is very expansive. Uh, there's a lot going on in it. I'm getting layers and it's long. So if I go 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it is still there, which validates the complexity I was talking about before. For some of you, this might be your idea of heaven. For some of you, it just might be mean, but nevertheless, it is what it is. And I think it's a really great example of what it is. Great. Um, I have a question here on what is a leaderboard? 
I'm going to show this to you guys on the after hours if you can stay. And I'm on the leaderboard right now. So, um, Evan, should I keep moving to the mm -hmm. options? Mm -hmm. So what do we have here? We have Cabernet Sauvignon as a blend, and I think Tim quite eloquently talked about some of the markers you should be looking for in Cabernet. Obviously, you're going to have deeper color. You're probably going to have more oak. It's probably going to be newer. Um, you're going to probably get a lot of other things. You have Nebbiolo, the great, the great grape of Piemonte, which uh, uh, tends to be, if you've had Barolo or Barbaresco, you know the sort of staunchness, the power of it, the ageability of it, et cetera. Sangiovese, oftentimes blended with other grapes locally, whereas Nebbiolo more often than not is by itself, is which you would find still in Italy, but if you move further south to Tuscany, and it can be an easy, as easy as quaffable as Novo Chianti or as serious as something like Brunello di Montalcino, um, and it, it to Italian, Italian flavor, and then you have other, um, Italian grapes are grown in places other than Italy. Uh, so um, if you were thinking about that, think about that too. But France, clearly for Cabernet, not the Italian grapes. California grows it all and Argentina grows it all. Cool. All right. We're just going to give everybody a few more seconds. Uh, some folks thought it was Amarone. Um, not not that... big enough, not raisined enough, not sweet ripe enough uh, to be Amarone, and certainly not alcoholic enough to be Amarone. Amarones are big um, Zinfandels on steroids, made in an and, Italian way. And Evan, do you think that this is a clean wine, or is there some VA showing? Oh, um, I mean, all, 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 no, I, I think most Italian wines, most Italian red wines, are, unless they're made in a modern squeaky clean style, always are going to have a rustic edge. And that rustic edge uh, could be volatile acidity. Uh, it could be uh, Brett. It could be um, a number of different things. But remember that all of these quote unquote flaws um, can be attributes as long as they're not over the top. So would, would I say there was some volatility, perhaps a kiss of, for lack of better words, using the generous term of funk and maybe a bit of like sort of leathery, saddle leather, bready sort of stuff there? Absolutely. But that's part and parcel, I believe, of both the style of wine, the nature of the grape and how it manifests itself. Great. Awesome. I'm going to end this poll and share the results. We have Nebbiolo uh, leading the pack, San Giovese as a close second. So I do think that we might want to explain the difference between the two once we reveal. Yep. And 86% on Italy. Yeah. Let's see if you guys are right. All right, let's let's uh, let's jump back uh, in our little car. Let's start in South Africa. Wave bye-bye to our friends in Cape, Cape area. Uh, get up high in that plane up to 30,000 plus feet. Enjoy a little uh, South African wine on the way out on whatever airline you are on. Hold on to the bars and get ready to head back up. So we're moving along. We're heading back northward. We're obviously leaving the Southern Hemisphere. We're going back into the Northern Hemisphere. We're going back to Europe. We're passing over France and we're ending up in Italia. And we're ending up in Piemonte, and we're ending up in Monforte uh, d'Alba, specifically. Uh, and we're ending up in uh, the commune of Bar well, the wines of Barolo, uh, made by the great house of Aldo Clerico. So um, Barolo, of course, is pure 100% uh, Nebbiolo. So to answer the question about the differences of Nebbiolo and Sangiovese, Right off the bat, the two things, they, they share two things in common. They share acid in common, but the acid in common is almost always more bracing with Nebbiolo than it is with Sangiovese. They both do drop color, but Nebbiolo drops it at a quicker pace and they both have tannin, but the tannins are arguably um, meaner, uh, harder, um, angrier in Nebbiolo than they are in Sangiovese. So if you're always looking to make that call, one color will generally be lighter in Nebbiolo, again, depending on the house and style and everything, but your acid levels will always be higher. Your tannins will, like I said, be sort of angrier and meaner. Those are usually your clues. So Aldo Clerico um, is a name that the Clerico name is certainly probably familiar to you, Domenico Clerico, uh, who is Aldo's father's cousin, if you can follow with that one, uh, was really the guy that helped sort of shepherd modern day 
uh, modern uh, Barolo to us. Things used to be very, very traditional. Uh, this wine is, I would say, in that more traditional vein. Um, and his literally his estate, Aldo Clerico's estate being family, is right next door to Domenico Clerico's estate, where you get that little nuance of, 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 of still embracing the past is uh, Aldo's wife, Valentina, is a Conterno, right? So she, their same town, same in all that, but Paolo uh, Conterno is her father and Conterno wines are again, I think made in a more traditional uh, leaning style, but they have a six hectare property in Monforte uh, where they were both born and raised and um, make, uh, I think a really uh, spot on wine. They make a killer, uh, just straight Nebbiolo d'Albo, which is a great, uh, value for the money and a delicious Barbera as well too. Although their Barbera, I think Domenico's Barbera or the house of Domenico Clerico is a standout Barbera in my mind's eye, but lovely. What I think is important to note here is look at the vintage. First of all, let it not be said that we at Master of the World don't like to show you older wines in, in addition to current vintage wines, but it's not, it's a treat to actually sort of see what happens to Barolo in seven years. You know, what happens to it there? Um, you know, we've shown Riojas before that were 10 and 12 years old. So it's fun to sort of see the other side of that and see that sort of drying, more mature uh, character of it, particularly in a grape, because if we showed you current vintage, you know, pulled it out of barrel sample 2020, Nebbiolo from Barolo, you'd never come back. <laughs> we don't want that. True. <laughs> to say it, put it simply, yep, yep. All right. Okay, nice. so now we can address that question. I think it was, who was it, Benjamin? They had the question about uh, grape versus oak tannins. So Benjamin, if it's you, take a sip and notice the tannin in front of your mouth is a lot. And then there's tannin in the back, there's more. So for me, and this is just me, Evan may feel different. Grape tannin is in front of the mouth, oak tannin in the back. Absolutely. And this is a perfect example. Yeah. And when you've got both, it's sort of your entire mouth. And that's when you get that big pucker as well, too, in the middle palate. It's like the cage match of tannin. Yeah. UFC. <laughs> All right. Oh, wow. So wait, wait, wait. Uh, just, just say it one more time. Oak tannin, wood tannin in the back. Yeah, oak tannin in the back, grape tannin in the front. Great. Revelation. I love it. Thank you. Okay. We are to wine number six. Yes. Okay. I love Ooh, this. There's there Aldo and Valentina, by the way. Oh, yeah, very cool. Very, very cool couple. shot. Okay. Here we go. So last wine of the flight, everybody take it, tip it forward. Notice that this wine by far is has the most density mm -hmm. of color. It is almost opaque. In fact, it is. You can't see through the glass. I would call it an opaque ruby with purple lightning to a lighter purple rim. So whatever it is, it's serious stuff. It also stains the glass. Yeah. And then in terms of Tears, Lakes, Viscosity, surprisingly, I think, you know, I think the uh, Barolo we just had had higher alcohol, but this is, has medium plus to high. Okay. Mm -hmm. With staining of the tears, considerable. All right. And then on the nose, okay, what I've got here is predominantly black fruit. It's black currant, it's cassis, it's black cherry. There's also a little really bright, almost underripe blueberry. Uh, the black fruits are ripe, but there's a brightness to them. So I would just say just ripe. And then there's some red fruit too. There's sour cherry and cranberry. Uh, the floral qualities are violets and roses, very pretty on top of the glass. And from there, there are some green elements, some herbal elements, things like, oh, I don't know, chives, uh, greens, salad type greens. Um, what else? Um, some mushrooms, a so little bit of anise, which is star anise, which is very pretty. A uh, little bit of black tea, uh, maybe bergamot again. In terms of the earth mineral, not nearly as much. Uh, I would say there is a soil dusty component to it. And if you're not sure, <laughs> go back to the previous two red wines, especially to the Pinotage and smell it because in comparison, it's really earthy. And for that matter, so is the Barolo. Okay. It's a great side-by-side -side comparisons. All right. Uh, there's definitely some oak here and it is spicy, but more than that, it plays up things like the black tea and the coffee and the bitter chocolate. Um, a uh, wonderful wine. Okay, let's taste it. Mmm. Mmm, okay. 
So everybody, again, compared to the Barolo you just tasted, notice where most of the tannin is. It's in the back. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's definitely some tannin in the front, but there's a lot of tannin in the back. So we've got some oak on this. Uh, the alcohol to me is probably around 14%, so right on the, the, the border of being high. Uh, and then the acidity is elevated, medium plus. That, that connects to the tartar elements that we smelled and tasted. Um, what else about it? Definitely the oak is there. The tannin though is medium plus. It is definitely not high like the Barolo. Barolo, that's high tannin. That's totally grown up wine. You would never give that a glass of that to your Aunt Bernina from Des Moines who only drinks <laughs> one glass of wine a week. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, the Barolo's grown up wine, which is why we love it. Okay, this wine is definitely balanced. It's complete, it's seamless, it's long finish, and it's very strong varietally. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like a, a fastball from Justin Verlander to make a baseball comparison. Man, it's quality stuff and it's right down the pike. And I think it's delicious. It too, though, I think needs food. And somebody said that about the previous wine. And that's mm -hmm. because of the taste. Finishes long, complexity is medium plus and head towards high. All right. That's a lot of information to work with. Let's see what we have. Let's see. All right. I'm going to release the poll out here first so that people can answer along. Ooh, here we go. In here. All right, so we've got Cabernet blends. We've got Tempranillo and blend and Syrah and blend. Remember what I said about Tempranillo in terms of the, say, I mean, the Syrah, in terms of the savory qualities and the pepper. Uh, Tempranillo rarely has this kind of color. It just, you know, there are, there are exceptions. I know there are Ribeiro del Dueros that yeah. have a lot of color. Um, okay, and then you have your regions and you connect the dots. Great variety first, place second. Uh, Leaning, of course, on what drives the wine. Does fruit drive the wine or does other things do other things like uh, non-fruit and earth and mineral? Okay. And Tim, All just right. one, quick, one quick comment about coconut. If you do feel like there's coconut, is that a sign of new oak? Well, it's uh, coconut is often a sign of American oak. Yes. And who is that? Who said that? Carrie. Carrie, you know what? I don't get coconut on this wine. I just don't. I think, I think it was Andrea. Carrie was explaining that okay. coconut was a sign of American oak. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Andrea, I see you yeah, up there. Okay, yeah. Awesome. Uh, cassis liqueur, maybe, from Kristen? Uh, I like the cassis, definitely. In fact, I think I called it liqueur, not so much. All right, here's... All right, answers. so here's... We are, we, we're very firmly, Tim, in the new world. Mm -hmm. People are 83% people are in the new world here between Australia and California, yes. so that's an interesting uh, between the two places. And then I see variety, 67% in Cabernet, but I think you kind of helped that along too. Um, yes, I did. <laughs> which is great. All right. Something like cool. uh, leading the witnesses, yeah. I, I love it, I love it. Okay, so great, uh, here we are. I'm ciao Aldo, ciao Aldo. <laughs> awesome. So we're leaving the oh, old right. world. I love how silk has really dulled back the timing. Now we can really see it, but maybe we need to dial it back up just mm -hmm. a little bit. We, we were very close actually to um, Provence. Yep. Well, I and, mean, yes on the map thing. It takes oh, a long yeah, time yeah, yeah. From the world, from yeah. Mars. Um, yeah. Evan, the ping pong continues. We're back, Tim. Yeah, we're back in, uh, you know, uh, Obsidian Wine, Com Wine Company, uh, Red Hills. And this is, uh, you know, one of my favorite Cabernets. I have to, I have to, this is a personal favorite. I think, you know, as much as I love, you know, Napa Valley Cabernet, it's gotten so expensive. Uh, this wine to me is one of the great values in Cabernet. So this is, you know, three guys, two brothers, Peter Molnar and his brother Akbar, Michael Tyrion. They started the winery in 2002. They planted their first vineyards literally on this ridge top in Lake County at 2,300 feet. Um, and, you know, now the Red Hills AVA is really hot property because Andy Beckstoffer owns a thousand acres now and he's planted it all to Cabernet. And you can see why. This to me is a just a wonderful example of Cabernet that's not from Napa Valley. 
a, a touch earthier, but also planted at elevation, it has lift. So it has the acidity and the tartar elements to it. And these guys could be the only winery in California that uses Hungarian oak. So uh, they are of Hungarian origin and they actually contract with a cooper who's in Tokai and uh, use Hungarian oak. Uh, this particular wine was done in 40% new and then the rest in second and third year barrels. Um, and, and you can see it's $35 retail. And uh, again, I don't know how they can, how they can do that. And honestly, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, so it's a sentiment of favorite. I also worked uh, with these guys and other winemakers in Lake County for a couple of years. And so I have a soft spot in my heart for them. So. And Lake yeah. County is pretty far from San Francisco, but the good news is that Obsidian actually has a tasting room um, in Carneros. And yeah. you can taste their entire portfolio. That's actually one of my go-to spots when I have tourists uh, visiting me. I go to the uh, tasting room um, at the base of your know, cost grown bridge, you feel like you're already in wine country and you go to Carneros and there you have it. Yeah. The Poseidon vineyard, yeah. which is their, their name vineyard in, in yeah. Carneros, the, the Chardonnay out of there is just otherworldly. It's just delicious. Yeah. So I want to answer Kristen's question really. So Kristen, don't get hung up. I'm trying to figure out Hungarian oak. You know, what's important for you is to recognize oak notes if they're there and recognize new oak if it's there versus used oak. And then from there, worry about figuring out American oak versus everything else like French oak. This to me is not as, uh, you know, French oak to me is more a smoke and toast and structure. Uh, this to me is kind of in the middle. So it's not as spicy as American oak and certainly uh, not doesn't have the structure that French oak does. Note, uh, the next webinar is again a Friday. I'm really liking this Friday thing. Feels more relaxed even for us to be able to do it. Um, 1 p.m. Pacific. I hope you can make it. It's 1.36 a. If you haven't gotten your 1.36 a yet and you're a monthly subscriber, just know that we pushed back shipping because it was still hotter than we thought it would be in uh, a few different places in the, around the country. They just started shipping yesterday and they will be in time for November 18th. 